That little church on Liberty Hill. Come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty Go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. <sighs> Today is the, uh, not the last day of Advent, it's the last of the four Sundays in Advent where we celebrate and observe um, Christ and that he brings hope and peace and joy. And today we reflect on the love that Christ shows. Um, what's interesting, and you might notice the slight difference in the title of the message this morning, because we talked about how Christ brings joy, about how Christ brings peace, about how Christ brings hope. But today we're going to look at how Christ shows love. Because there's something about the birth of Christ that, yes, he brings love, that we are indeed love, that, we're, that, that we see the love. He is love just kind of exemplified. But that's the point, is that he's showing the world the love of God. <clears throat> and as we have been doing, we're going to take a look at uh, an episode in the Christmas story. Uh, specifically today, we're going to read about Joseph and about how he was showing love in his situation. And so let's go ahead and look in Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took him to him his wife, and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Even before he had been born, Jesus' great love for mankind was being shown and was motivating others to act in love. If we're going to talk about love and about how God loves us and how he shows love and he um, motivates love, well, we should actually know what love is. I remember years ago I was sitting, um, at the time I was single, but I was dating someone I was very interested in maybe um, rectifying that situation with. And uh, the, the preacher at the church I was working at was doing a series on marriage. It was for married couples. But I thought, he's a smart guy. I got lots to learn. So um, during the time period while class was in, I didn't have anything to be doing. So I would sit outside the door and listen, eavesdrop in on the class and take notes. And I remember one of the first things he said, and I've since copied that, and um, uh, those of you who may have done some counseling with me, you, you've heard me say this, that um, he said, we're not here to talk about love. He said, you ask 10 different people what the word means, you'll get 10 different answers. We're talking about marriage, we're here to talk about commitment. And so, um, but that stuck with me. But then I got to thinking about that idea of love. You ask 10 different people what is love, you're likely to get 10 different answers. That word has such wide range. And so whenever I say that Christ shows love, you can all be sitting there and have a wide range of different ideas of what you think I mean by that. So let's be clear what I mean by that. What I'm defining love as, what I'm showing the, the love of God to be, is love is, I think um, kind of the definition I've worked here, is that it is to desire or to pursue the good of someone else especially at cost to yourself. 
I think that's a good idea of what we mean when we say we love someone. When we say, I love you, what we mean is I want what is good for you. I want the best for you. My intentions, my desire, my will is good things for you. That's what we mean when we love someone. And Joseph shows this love. This is one of the most amazing stories, I think, uh, about an example of love. Before the angel even comes on the scene, this just shows, it says Joseph is a just man. He's a good man. He's a godly man. That he has a wife. We, we've talked before about the way Jewish betrothal works. That once you're engaged, what we would call engagement, it's a done deal. The contract is signed. All that is left to do is the man to prepare the home and then come back and get his bride. They, they are married at that point. And so that's where Joseph and Mary find themselves. Is he's not yet you know, gone. They haven't had the whole ceremony. They're in the betrothal period. It's all basically done. He just has to get the household ready to bring his bride home. And he discovers she's with child. Now, I've heard critics of Christianity say, those silly superstitious people back then, don't they know that virgins don't give birth? Yes, they were very much aware that virgins don't give birth. They knew how babies were made. And so they then, Joseph was going, wait a minute. I know what is required, and I haven't been a part of that. So something is going on here. But because of his love for Mary, it says that he wants to save her from the public shame and divorce her secretly. Kind of just probably go to her father and say, look, I don't want to cause problems. I don't want to shame her. I wish only the best for her. So let's just kind of do this quietly. He didn't have to, but he wanted to. He's showing his love for her in the way he's wanting to handle <clears throat> the situation. And then, of course, after the angel's message, he continues to show his love for her as her husband. But he also shows his love for God. That he answers God's call to, be, to, to take her as his wife and to be the father figure to raise Christ. I mean, that, you ever stop and think about exactly what it is that angel told him? Hey, go ahead and take Mary as your wife because the baby she's with, she didn't cheat on you. There's nothing hinky going on here, right? That's from the Holy Spirit. That's going to be the Christ. So why don't you just go ahead and take her as your wife and then you raise the Savior of the world, right? No pressure there. And so he obeys because he loves God. He wants God's will done because that is what glorifies God. God. We see that's how Joseph showed love. That he showed, I want what is best. I want what is good. I will for the good thing to happen in this situation. But you know, Christ also shows his love for us in several ways. As we, as we celebrate the baby in the manger, there are things about the baby and about the man and about God becoming a man that displays his love for us, beyond a doubt. And it's all several ways that we understand how love works. First off, that he is an example for us. Now, now before you think it would be an example for somebody, how does that show love? <clears throat> I have children. Some of you have children. Now, I, I learned something, I didn't learn, but it was just a really good like eye-opener as I'm working on this message, and then yesterday I have a situation happen. Yesterday was um, Annabelle's sixth birthday, and she had a fabulous day. She had people come over, and they had a little party with family, and she got gifts and everything that she could possibly want. And I mean, everything for the day, it was ice cream cake, y'all. It was a good day. Now, at some point in the day, something happened, and she was upset about it. She got her feelings hurt. It was not a pretty situation. Ran off to the room to cry. And so daddy went in there, and I, and I was talking to her, telling her, it's okay. I know that, that, that what they said you didn't like, but, you know, you've had a really good day. And she said, no, my birthday is ruined. And so I told her, don't think about that one bad thing. Think about all these other great things you've had with your day. 
And she said, I can't. And at that moment, since I'd been preparing for this message, it clicked. There's a difference between telling someone what they should do and then showing them how to do it. Because I love my child, it's not just quit thinking about the bad thing, think about the good things. No, no, no. I stepped into the role of the loving father and said, well, come here, baby. Let, let, let's think about the good things. What presents did you get? And she started listening off her presents. I said, did you have a favorite one? She told me your favorite. Why is that one your favorite? Did you like the cake? And so I sat there and drew out of her the good things to reflect on. I got down on her level and showed her how. And that's what Christ does for us. That God, even though sovereign of the universe, is well within his right to say, get your act together. He doesn't. He becomes a man to get down in the mess and the muck of life with us to show us how it's done. John 15, <clears throat> verse 12, says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He didn't just say, love each other. He said, I came and I showed you how to do it. Do it like that. We see this when he washes the feet of the disciples. He, he gets down, king of kings, lord of lords, the, their rabbi, their lord, the person they follow, that they hold up above all others, gets down on his knees and washes their nasty feet. And then after he is done, John 13, 15, he says, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. He didn't just say, guys, love each other. He got down and he showed us how it's done. Second, he shows that he loves us by the fact that he relates to us. More specifically, that he has lived a life in a way that we can relate to him. <clears throat> One of my favorite stories is uh, I was preparing for uh, this past Wednesday's lesson about the history of Christmas and the different things in Christmas is the nativity. Uh, the nativity as we experience it, as we celebrate it, as we show it. You know, many of you probably have a nativity in your home, right? Th there would be nativity celebrations. There might be some kind of display in a church, but that was always something that the church did. Well, St. Francis of Assisi, he wanted to bring the story of Jesus to the poor. Now you stop and think about, rewind and think about, it. you're talking about a Catholic church, cathedral, or you know, just this big, inspiring, just like awe-inspiring building, probably filled with gold and silver instruments. The priest with his robes and everything just looked so otherworldly. It looked so beyond anything in our lives. So St. Francis, he, he took the nativity and he had a friend who kind of helped him get together the parts of it to where he actually built the stable. He, he's what, he, this is what gave us that image that we have sitting right over there of what the nativity looks like with the stable and the manger and the animals and everybody, the shepherd and the kings and everybody all there. He's the one that put that together and he did it so that he could do it out on the street and show the poor this is what the King of Kings did for you. It's one thing to go and sit in a cathedral and see a guy wearing gold telling you that Jesus was born in a manger, but to actually physically see that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords stepped out of glory and was laid in a feeding trough, in a barn, with all of this around him, that he made himself low that we could relate to him. As Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16 says, We do not have a high priest, Jesus is our high priest, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whatever situation we find ourselves in, whatever temptation we are struggling with, whatever hardship comes our way, whatever it is that life throws at us, we can know Jesus went through it too. He's not sitting aloft in some ivory tower detached from real life. That's how other religions view their gods. You realize that there are religions where this is blasphemous, the idea that God would become a man. How dare you? That's what other religions think. 
in ancient times, the gods, that they, they've lived up there on that mountain. They lived off over there away from us. But no, not Christianity. Jesus stepped down into life and said, I'm here with you. I want to experience it with you. I know what you are going through. And he is with us as we go through it. And I think that's the third kind of important way that he shows his love for us, that he is with us, Emmanuel, God with us. First church I served at on staff, there was uh, the, the head deacon. Um, you ever hear somebody say something so much you just get sick of it? Even if it's a good thing, you just hear it so much. It's like food, right? doesn't matter how much you like something. The more you eat it, you just kind of get sick of it and want something else. He, his favorite thing to talk about was the importance of the ministry of presence. That we be in people's lives, that we be in the community, that we need to be present with people. And he would just hammer, he literally, he, he, he would. He, he'd, he'd get up there on Sunday morning, he'd give his little Sunday school report, and then he'd take a few minutes to talk about how we need ministry of presence. And I got so sick of that phrase, but he's right. Because it shows you love someone, right? Just the fact that you're willing to be there with them shows that you love. Then it just that, that, that someone is there with you in the moment. Guys, we struggle with this because we see a problem and we, we want to fix it. Sometimes, you know, those of you who've been married a while, you know women don't want it fixed sometimes. They just want you to be there because it shows you love them. Jesus did this often. Uh, he didn't just go around teaching. He didn't just go around going, here, let me give you some theological doctrine by which you can, you know, know more about God. He didn't just go around saying, here, let me give you some commandments so you can live your life right. He walked and lived with people. Over and over and over again, we see Jesus in the town square teaching, sure, but at dinner tables over and over again. Just in the Gospel of Luke alone, in Luke 5, he eats with tax collectors and sinners at the home of Levi. In Luke 7, he's at the home of Simon the Pharisee having a meal. In Luke 10, he eats in the home of Mary and Martha. By the way, he eats there often. That kind of seems to be his go-to place when he's in town. In Luke 22, we read the account of the Last Supper where he's breaking bread with his disciples. Over and over again, you see Jesus sharing a meal with people. And I love that first one because the leaders of the Jews are losing their mind because he's dining with who? Sinners and tax collectors. I've got a neighbor and oh my goodness, they're just such a sinner. Good, invite them to dinner. That coworker of mine, the things that they believe, I just go, good, invite them to dinner. So Jesus did. Because a meal, especially back then, a meal is more than just eating food. It's community. It's relationship. It's grace. It's hospitality. It associates you with that person. It represents friendship. Sharing meals with people to Jesus was showing love merely by his presence there with them. why the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, is so beautiful. God with us. As I already said, in some religions, the idea that God would come down to be with us might get you killed. But we know better. We see it for what it is. It's a powerful indication of the love of God that he would look at the mess of mankind and go, I can come down there with you. Here, let me walk the road with you for a while. <clears throat> and lastly, the one that we talk about so often, the thing that shows his love so powerfully is his sacrifice for us. One of, if not the, most powerful indicators that you love someone is your willingness to sacrifice for them. Amen? <clears throat> Parents, isn't that one of the ways you show love for your children? Right? That, that, that 
there were a time in my life when my, my parents, I, I've, I've said before, I might go two or three days, not even see them because they were working 60, 80 hours a week, not counting the commute they had to drive an hour, hour and a half, two hours to get to where they're going to even get to work. And I would just, you know, they would, I'd go to bed and they weren't home. I'd wake up and they were already gone. And there'd be a note on the counter that says, love you. Here's your lunch money. Have a good day. But they were showing they loved me because all of that work that they were putting in was paying for the roof over my head and the food in my belly. That they were able to say, hey, here's some lunch money. Have a good day at school. Yeah, they, they were able to do that because of the sacrifice. Gifts, whenever we give you, this is Christmas time, so we talk about gifts. Whenever you give a gift, doesn't it actually mean something if it actually costs the person something? Right? It's always a funny scene in a movie whenever someone comes in, you know, to a hospital room, like, here, I got you some flowers, when really they didn't. They just grabbed them from the room down the hall. And it's like, we, you know, you chuckle because it's funny in the movie, but, I mean, honestly, how is that received? Right? If you're in the hospital and you've been injured and you're recovering and someone comes in, they couldn't be bothered to buy you a flower. They stole it from someone else. Does that show you that they love you? Well, you know, it's the thought that counts. Well, the thought counts a little bit, yeah, sure. But there's something about when it comes from someone that it has meaning. Any of you ever um, listen to any inspirational talks? Or even in like marriage counseling, I've seen this get said. How do you spell love? T-I-M-E. Time. It shows someone that you love them when you're willing to spend time with them. Why? Because time is the most valuable commodity you have. You sacrifice and give some money, you go make some more money time you don't get back once you've given it it's gone you don't get that back and so the fact that you're willing to give something so valuable to someone else shows them that you love them john 15 13 jesus says greater love has no one than this that they lay down their life for their friends Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for it towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How does God show his love for us? That he was willing to sacrifice for us. John 3.16, throw in 17 because everybody always just skips that, but it's so great. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It blows my mind that Christianity is viewed by so many people as a religion of condemnation. Our Savior came into the world to save Jesus Christ, the baby, came to the manger to save, not to condemn. I love in this verse, it says, for God so loved the world. A lot of times we skip over that little word and we just talk about, oh, well, God loved the world. No, he so loved the world. Do you realize there's a magnitude of intensity to his love, that he so loved the world? The immenseness of the love that he had for us, and that love compelled him to do what? To sacrifice. And to sacrifice why? So that we might be saved. The birth of Jesus shows God's love for mankind. Demonstrated beyond doubt. There are times in our lives that we're going to wonder and we're going to question, God, do you really love me? And it usually comes from one of two places. One, it's either us going, how could you love me? You ever wrestle with that? Because I know me. How can you love this? Well, he's shown you that he does. 
regardless of what you may look in the mirror, you may look in your heart and you may say, God, how could you possibly love that? Well, he looks back and says, I already showed you that I do. Second place that we tend to doubt God's love is because the hardships and situations that come to us in life. And we say, God, how could you love me if you allowed this to happen to me? But yet we can look back and we can see he's already shown us that he loves us. Whatever the roots of our doubts, they do not overshadow the fact of God's love, which he has displayed to us in the birth and the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But this love that he has shown, he has not shown us to us merely for ourselves. It's good that we can look on and we see Christ and we see his birth and the life and the sacrifice that has been made and we know, thank you, God, I know that I am loved. But it is not merely that we might know we are loved. One of the ways that Christ shows love, as we said, is that he is our example. That he came down, like like with a little kid, he got on the floor with us and said, here, let me show you how you do that. Let me show you how you love. Let me show you how you serve. Let me show you how you be a good person to care for those around you, to show compassion, that you consider others greater than yourself, that you love your enemy, that you pray for those that curse you, that you not only bless those who bless you, anyone can do that, but how about you bless those who are of no benefit to you at all? He said, here, let me come down and show you what it looks like that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He said, let me come down and show you what it looks like that you love your neighbor as yourself. And he exemplified that for us so that we now can have that love and show it to others. Not merely for us that we can go, thank you, God, now I know you love me. But now we can go and thank you that you love me. Now let me show it to others, to take the light which has come into the world, and because he has shown us the way, shown us the means, he has shown us the hope and the peace and the joy and the love that he has for us, that that light that has shined into the darkness in our hearts, we can be a beacon in a dark and fallen world to show that love to the rest of mankind. That's what the baby in the manger means. It means his love, the love of Christ, God's love shown to mankind beyond a doubt that our hearts might find hope and joy and peace and that we take that gift and we give it to those around us. Every time I feel the walls closing Cover me and breathe life in me again Lord, though I feel the darkness come I will not fear You've ransomed me with blood Okay, go ahead and open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. As we uh, continue our journey through uh, celebrating Christ in His birth uh, in this Christmas season, Um, in this time of Advent, um, as the official church liturgical term is for this time. Um, Matthew chapter 2. Those of you who were here Wednesday, we took a look at part of this story. This is the um, coming of the wise men, and we looked at the star, and what was the star? And so that's what we talked about Wednesday, and um, I I think I pretty firmly fell on the side that it was a supernatural event. uh, though people throughout the ages have had different ideas about that. Yeah, but I, I think that that was God's handiwork in there. Well, this morning we're going to take a look at the, the Magi themselves, the, the fact that they came and, and how it shows the hope that they had and the hope that we have in the birth of Christ. So in Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes, the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. What we see in the story of the visit of the Magi is hope being fulfilled. That they had a hope for the coming of Messiah. And here we see that they come to the realization of that hope. They had been looking for the coming of the king, and they see his arrival. I mean, we all have things that we hope for, but isn't it great whenever we actually see them come to fruition, that, that, that we receive the thing for which we had hoped? If we're going to talk about Christ, that his birth being an occasion to bring hope, well, let's just define the word, because I find so often uh, there can be confusion around what exactly you mean about something whenever you say a term, because sometimes we all think of things a little different. So here's what I'm referring to by hope. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it says hope is to cherish a desire with anticipation to want something to happen or to be true. So the Magi, they had hope that, that Christ would be born. Right? They cherished the idea of Christ's birth with anticipation that it will actually come to be. According to another online dictionary, it says the feeling that hope is the feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. And so here's this thing that is being wanted, that is being perceived, the promise that they're expecting to be fulfilled, and they see they're hoping, not just merely thinking, oh, it'd be really nice if this would actually happen, but they're perceiving it will happen, they're anticipating that it will come to pass, and they're looking for it, and they see it fulfilled. The Magi, indeed all of Israel, had hope that Christ would come, but the Magi were the ones paying attention. Israel, not so much. What we have here in the story of the Magi is prophecy being confirmed. That there's one prophecy in particular that is specifically mentioned about the birth of Christ being in Bethlehem. It quotes that from Micah 5.2. It's not going to be a wild leap to conclude that the wise men had in mind other prophecies as well. Right? The, the, who, who are these men from the East, these wise men, these magi, these, you know, um, history would probably tell us if these are who we think they are, that they are kingly advisors, they are scholars um, that would advise kings, they might even topple kings. Um, and so here they are, but they're, they're not Jews, but yet they're looking for the Jewish Messiah. How did they know the Jewish Messiah was to come? Well, a common theory, and it's one that I hold to, is that they would have received this information from the prophet Daniel. Right? Whenever Daniel was in Babylon, that he was one of the wise men, that at one point he was placed in charge of the wise men over them all. And so surely the prophet Daniel's influence would have been um, great upon the Magi, so it stands to reason that there would be those who would believe, and so they are looking forward to the coming promise that Daniel's prophecies gave. There's two in particular that I think are relevant. One in Daniel 9, 25, when it talks about when Messiah would come. 
It says, Now therefore understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. This is the part of the 70 weeks prophecy. It says, From the time a command is given for Jerusalem to be rebuilt, this amount of time will pass and then Messiah will come. Well, if they knew that prophecy, they knew to be looking when the time was right. And the time was right, and so they were looking. But also in Numbers 24, 17, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Right? So the prophet's saying, I'm seeing something, but it's something that's going to come later. And here's what he sees. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. That there will be a king scepter, that a king, that a king is going to rise out of Israel. He says, a star will rise out of Jacob. And there they are. They see a star rise out of Israel at the time that the king who's been promised is supposed to come. And so they see the promises being fulfilled. They likely knew the prophecies promising that Christ is going to be there. They had hope that he would come. And what was their response upon seeing this hope be fulfilled? It tells us in verse 10 that when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. I mean, because you think about this, from the prophet Daniel to this time of Christ being born has been centuries. So they know the prophecies. They know God is God. They know His word is good. So they know it's coming. They know the time is here. Here it is. We've been waiting. We've been reading the prophecies. We know it's coming. We know this is the time. There's the star. And the excitement that they had to have felt seeing what they've been hoping for come to fruition. And the thing that I think stands out from this is that if you understand the Bible, the Bible is a book of hope. Over and over and over again, promises are made and delivered on. Proverbs 13, 12 says that de ho hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. God doesn't make empty promises. And whenever he says, I will do this, and then people hope, but then they see it come to fruition. Throughout Scripture, promises are made and promises are fulfilled. Throughout Scripture, people are given something to look forward to, and then it comes to be. You have Abraham and Sarah. Right? They're, they're promised a child. No, we can't have a child, God. We're barren. It doesn't work that way. And God says, no, no, I will give you a child. But yet, many years passed between the time of the promise and the birth of Isaac. But they were hoping. They understood the promise of God, and they had hope that one day they will see it fulfilled, and they did. You have Israel in the land of Egypt. They've been told, you're going to go away, but, but there will be a deliverer. And so there they languish in bondage for 400 years, looking forward to, hoping for the time that God will bring them out of Egypt. And he eventually he does. He sends Moses. Israel acquires the promised land. Over 400 years had passed since the time that God stood there with Abraham and said, this land you see, I will give to your descendants. They knew it was coming. They knew it was theirs. They had hope that one day that promise will be fulfilled, and then one day it was. In the book of Judges, we see a cycle of oppression and delivery where the people of Israel are under the oppression of a foreign power and they hope for the day that God will rescue, and then he does. He sends a Gideon or a Samson to come and rescue and fulfill that hope. As the Jews are in exile in Babylon, they have been told by the prophet that you're going to go into exile for 70 years and then you will come out. And then so for that 70 years, they have hope. God has told us that we will come out of this. And then the time comes, the hope is fulfilled. And so you see over and over and over again that God promises and then the people have hope in the promise and then it's delivered upon. Christianity is a religion of hope. 
that we have something to hope for, that we have something that we can know, we have meaning, that we can know there is a God who delivers and who is there. It's interesting that right now, um, it, it would seem like atheism is like the, the biggest threat kind of encroaching in society on Christianity, and in some areas it is um, statistically those who would say there is no God are still a really small percentage of the population. A lot of people who aren't religious, they still think, oh, sure, there's a God out there, but I don't know who he is, and so they're not religious, or they just don't care. Um, but the people who would say there is no God, and it's actually kind of small, even though they have a very, very loud voice, particularly on the Internet. But what's interesting is that as people embrace an idea that there is no God, hey, you Christians, yeah, you can do whatever you want in church, just leave that in the church building. When you come out in the public square, keep it to yourself, right? This idea that God has no place in school, God has no place in politics, God has no place in the public square, just keep your beliefs to yourself. And it teaches that there is no God, or if he's there, he's not important. But atheism, the idea of dismissing God, gives us zero hope at all. Necessarily, a godless existence is an existence that has no hope. And there are people who will like to disagree with me, and so rather than just me saying that, let me quote some uh, philosophers and scholars who are themselves atheists. According to uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, he says, If God does not exist, man is in consequence forlorn, for he cannot find anything to depend on either within or outside of himself. Dan Barker, who is an atheist ag uh, ad activist, uh, debater. Um, he is a former evangelical minister himself. He admits and he celebrates the hopelessness. He says, there is no purpose to life, and we should not want there to be a purpose to life. Atheist. Um, atheist William Provine says, let me summarize my view on what modern evolutionary biology tells us. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I am going to be dead, and that's the end for me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. It's an atheist being honest about what his beliefs entail. Same guy also says, no inherent moral or ethical laws exist, nor are there any absolute guiding principles for human society. The universe cares nothing for us, and we have no ultimate meaning in life. See, this is what happens whenever atheists are honest about their beliefs and what it entails. Uh, David Silverman, another um, atheist activist, used, uh, is or used to be president of Atheist of America, says, There is no objective moral standard. We are responsible for our own actions. The hard answer is that morality is a matter of opinion. No right or wrong, just whatever you happen to think. Frederick Nietzsche says, when one gives up Christian belief, one thereby deprives yourself of the right to Christian morality. Oh, society likes to go around and say, oh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Oh, really? You're going to throw Christianity out the door, but you want to keep the teachings? It's not how it works. There have been philosophers who actually described uh, ethics in society as a flower. And when you cut the roots off the flower, right, when you cut the flower from its roots, well, it might stay nice for a little while. Maybe you can put it in some water and give it some plant food, and it's going to stay pretty and smell good for a little while. But eventually it will wither. And as you separate society from the Christian roots of good and bad, those ideas of morality will wither. Uh, atheist philosopher Michael Rue says that ethics is a shared illusion of the human race. What is right and wrong or good or bad? Eh, we just all kind of have this same illusion. So what hope can godlessness offer? None. If there is no God, then hope is merely an illusion. That there is no hope. There can be no hope. It's a useful fiction that we pretend in order to get by if there is no God. 
Apart from God, life has no real meaning. Apart from God, there can be no truly right or wrong decisions or actions. Recently, there was an attack in London. A guy with a knife attacked several people, and then some other citizens came to their rescue, one of which, where he, I don't know what building he was in, but he happened to just grab something off the wall, and it was a narwhal tusk. And so he, he's got this big, you know, like spiky tusk of a narwhal, and he's coming after the guy and some other people. So, but on atheism, if there is no God, the terrorist attacker and the heroic citizens, no difference. Either one, doesn't matter. You could be one, you could be other. One's not better. Hard work and integrity, you go to work, you clock in, and you make sure you do your job right, you do it the way they want it done, and you do it honestly with integrity, or you just kind of fluff off, you're late to work, you just do whatever, you embezzle and steal some money from the company, it doesn't matter, just do either one. If there is no God, they're both the same thing, neither one better or worse than the other. The hurt that you have been done or the hurt that you have done to others, the love that you have shown to others, doesn't matter. Love people, hurt people. If there is no God, it's all the same. Maybe this is the reason why people would reject God. Some people reject God because they know that if God is real, then they actually have to answer for their actions that their choices and their actions matter and have moral consequence. They reject God so they can pretend that the bad things they do don't actually matter and aren't actually bad. But we know that's not the case. Amen? You know that good and bad, right and wrong, are very real things. There are some things in life that really are evil. And there are some things in life that really are good and noble and right. And if there are these objective moral values and duties, then there must be a God. And if there is a holy, moral, just God that exists, then He must judge evil. And of course, we all also know that we do evil. But that brings us back full circle to Christ and the hope that we see in the story of his birth and the coming of the Magi, that Christ's birth brings hope. The reason that Christ's birth brings hope is twofold. First, there's a promise of forgiveness, and second, there's a promise of Christ's return. We know that there will be forgiveness. Let me give you a handful of verses. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, There is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Ephesians 1.7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Acts 10, 43, to Him all the prophets witness that through His name, whoever believes in Him will receive remission of sins. Romans 10, 9, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I could take those five verses, replace them with five others. Could take those and replace them with five others. Take those, replace them with five others. Over and over and over again, the Bible tells us there is forgiveness of sin because of Jesus Christ. But we don't just hope because of our personal state of being able to be forgiven for the wrongs that we have done, because we also know there's something just wrong in the world. And it's not just that Jesus came so that he might give forgiveness of sins, but that also the goal is a redemption of the world, that evil be done away with. And one day Christ will return. John 14, 
It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may also be. That one day, this broken world in which we live in, Christ will come and take us to where the brokenness is healed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Acts 11, Peter, uh, no, this is uh, the angel. Jesus just ascended, right? Jesus was just there with his disciples. He just ascended up into the clouds, and they're all standing there. You know, probably jaws open, just gaped me to look up in the sky like, wow, that just happened. And an angel appears and says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He will come Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we, for, uh, <clears throat> let me try that again, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that this world, this life is not our home, that we are foreigners, we are strangers in a strange land, and one day we will go home, that Christ will come back to take us home. Over and over and over again, Scripture promises that Christ will return. And as we consider the promises of God concerning our future glory and the grace which we have received through Jesus Christ, we know God keeps His promises. Amen? God keeps His promises. The Magi saw the fulfilled prophecies of God in the Old Testament, and they were looking forward to the birth of Christ, knowing He kept all those promises. He's going to keep this one too. And they had hope that one day they would see the coming of the king and that time came and their hope was fulfilled. Likewise, we see the fulfilled prophecies of Scripture and we see the fulfilled prophecies of the birth of Christ. And because we look and we say God keeps his promises, we look at the promises we're given for forgiveness of our hearts and for the future glory to come that he will return and we have hope because we know that God keeps His promises. Because we know that the Magi came to worship a child. Right? That, that the shepherds came, as we talked about last week, it was a baby. It was a baby wrapped up in some rags, laying in a feeding trough. But they rejoiced because of the hope that child brought. Because that child would grow up to be the man who would die on the cross that we might be forgiven and that same man who was God made flesh went to heaven and one day will come back again to take us home that we may be where there is no more sin, there is no more death. And the brokenness in this world and our hearts has been healed. And so as the Magi looked forward to and hoped for the coming of Christ at his birth, we look forward to and have hope in the coming of Christ in his forgiveness and in his return. 